We come to uh, look at these words this morning. What's the one word that when it comes out of a preacher's mouth means nothing whatsoever? Any idea? I can tell you what it is. It's the word finally. (laughs) The number of times that I've heard someone else, and probably even me, the front of a church, front of a conference, or just about any gathering to be fair, uh, say that word and then watch them go on for at least as long as they'd already spoken is beyond counting. Did you know there's a biblical precedent? This morning we come to the fourth chapter and the fourth message in our series from 1 Thessalonians. And it starts with that word, in, uh, not in the NIV, but in other, other, uh, quite a number of other translations, with that word, finally. It's a promise that Paul is about to wrap up his beautiful letter. But in reality, he's far from it. In fact, if you do the maths, there are 43 verses before he gets to that word and 46 verses. Afterwards, (laughs) Afterwards, <laughs> we aren't even halfway there yet. However, we are halfway through our series as we come to look at uh, Paul's writing here. And I suspect uh, the reason is that rather than cl- coming to the close of a letter, he's changing track. Up to now, Paul has been very affirming in all that he has to say to the Thessalonians. He's ha- he has been affirming their faith, affirming his relationship to them, and the relationship they have with him. It's been a really encouraging letter, don't you think? But as we come to chapter 4, Paul, while still retaining that tone, he's going to start to do a little bit more in the way of teaching. So as we do get to that, let's, let's uh, pray as we come to explore that together. Gracious God, we thank you that, uh, for these words that Paul had written to the Thessalonian church so long ago. Lord, we thank you that today we are still learning from them. So we pray today that once again, we will uh, hear your word, hear your spirit as he works works it into our lives and be transformed by it. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to think of someone that you've always wanted to impress. Who might it be? For me, it's a few people. Uh, there's uh, no, teachers, parents, <laughs> Ali, the lecturers, even the odd boss. No, people I've what really wanted to make sure I'd impress them with, with the way I acted, the things that I did. One of those teachers was a history teacher I had in year 11. And the topic was modern European history. So it was, I, I really loved it. It was of interest to me and I just... I didn't know enough about it, and I was really looking forward to digging into it. It was so interesting to hear about the intricacies, the events over the last 100 years or so that had happened in that part of the world, and I happily listened. I took long notes every week, and each week we had to hand in an essay, short essay about that period of history that had been featured the previous week, and I really enjoyed writing them too a while. See, I love the material. I love the lectures. I love the books. I found myself unable, even as much as I'd loved all that, I found myself unable to write a reasonable essay to his standards. I was always languishing around the 55 to 65 percent mark rather than my usual 80s and 90s, which I was accustomed to receiving at the time. I received a couple of marks that were were, um, kind of up to my preference area. The problem was I had no idea why, what the difference was. I simply didn't know how to please him. Fortunately, all was redeemed when I wrote essays for church history when I got to my theology degree and and received decent marks for those, but not without some level of trepidation because of what had gone before. Isn't it so much easier when the people you you, you want to please tell you what you have to do to do so? Thankfully, Paul does just that, not just for him, but just what God wants of them over the next couple of chapters of this first letter to the Thessalonian church. Some time ago, I was preaching on 1 Corinthians, and in that letter, Paul was once again writing to a church, 
providing some input into some of the aspects of their life together. And in that case, Paul had some significant issues with what they were doing. The Corinthian Christians were starting to go way off course, being so passionate and so vibrant in their faith that they almost lost their way. The way they were treating each other, even the way they worshipped together. It's really easy to understand why Paul had to write to stop the rot and get them flying right again. But the Thessalonian churches were actually doing all right. In fact, Paul affirms their faith. He writes, As for other matters, brothers and sisters, we instructed you how to live in order to please God, as in fact you are living. No, this is not new stuff. You already know this. Now we ask you and urge you in the Lord Jesus to do this more and more. To go the next level, for you know what instructions we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus. And then, a little bit further along, Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Paul admits they're not doing anything wrong. In fact, they're doing so much right. They're already doing what they were taught to do, just as Paul had taught them. So why does Paul go on now, teaching them again? Why is he getting to sexual sin? Keeping their heads down rather than seeking social advancement. Well, let me give you an uh, an analogy. At one point, Ali and I um, heard a dietitian talking about how you need to, uh, how to eat healthily and lose weight. In Australia, it would be fair to say that uh, at some time or another, most people have tried something to try and lose weight, to try and make themselves healthier. People try lots of different things, you know, dieting, exercise, special supplements, even surgery. But the research will tell you again and again that the best way to lose weight is to find a sustainable way of eating healthily. A well-balanced, regular diet that meets your needs and fits your normal lifestyle. Then you'll keep going with it. All the other stuff will help for a while, but none of them will provide that lasting effect, lasting benefit, unless you actually do that hard work, that long-term work. The problem with that is that most people find that it takes time, doesn't it? It doesn't happen overnight. And sometimes you even have challenges doing it or even go backwards for a time. It's so easy to get disappointed and demotivated. So what happens then? Usually one of two things. Either they try and uh, try and get back to one, another one of those methods with a short term gain. They take supplements or go on the diet, or for a short time, and and for a short time, that problem just goes away. But after not too long, you're back to normal again. The usual patterns resume, and the problems occur, come back even worse, perhaps sometimes, than they were in the first place. Or you can even go the other way. They get so disappointed that they go back to their old habits, eat all the stuff they know they shouldn't, back onto all the naughty food again, Uh, And they're worse off than they started as well. In Paul's letter, he seems to be addressing the dangers, not about food, but about living out their faith in a cultural, countercultural way. The Thessalonians have done so well, not just accepting Jesus, but in following Jesus in the face of really serious persecution. The same persecution, as you might remember, as Paul experienced when he was there just for three weeks. They've got it for their lifetime. They've stuck with Christ, though, and have been following the life that Paul had taught. They've stuck with it all the way through, the way that they are supposed to live in response to the incredible grace that God has shown them through Jesus. As we mentioned in that first first week, that meant turning away from other gods. But that was far more than just going to a different church, doing things differently when when you worship. It actually impacted their ability to be part of society, the way things worked, because of so much of how the culture in Thessalonica 
function was based around their worship practices, was based around their temples, all the things that happened there on a regular basis. And what was more, the worship of, other, of those other gods came with other indulgences, like drinking too much, like the sexual, uh, sexual um, encounters. Those and other aspects of life were put to one side as they followed a new way of life, following the one true God. Worshipping God wasn't about experiences, but about being people who showed others what God was like. Loving, just, gracious and holy. The Thessalonians have embraced all this well and really wholeheartedly. And they've been so faithful in spite of serious opposition. But Paul probably quite rightly assumes that there are times when they're feeling pretty despondent. It must have been tempting to look back at those old days and thinking, gee, life was so much better back then. And so much easier. I could get things done so much more easily, even less costly. There were a few more checks and balances that I had to worry about. They might have even started to miss it. Particularly when they knew that those things weren't particularly right, but culturally were pretty acceptable. Would it really just hurt to go off the rails every now and again? What harm could it really do? Second, uh, the second danger that Paul talks about is that desire to climb, climb the social ladder. If they were more important socially, maybe that could stop the persecution too. Not just for them, but for other Christians too. That'd be great. What a, what a great, uh, great goal. And you're not just doing it for you, you're being selfless in it too. What would it take to rise to that level, to gain to that level of approval? It would involve slotting back into that society again, into the way they used to live. And while they would start out uh, trying to retain their grip on their faith, eventually there will be pressure to compromise, to bend back, then not only they would lose their place with God, but they ran the risk of the persecution becoming more intense on those who kept the race. The problem that Paul states for them and for us is that at the end of the day, if we start entering back into those things that we once were part of, incorporating bits and pieces from a life without God, even though they don't really belong there anymore, as, as much as we might think we're in control, we're not. We just think we're taking a little holiday from giving, uh, giving God complete rule of our lives. But in fact, when we do that, we aren't just taking that control back for ourselves. We're handing it over, handing it over to the one who loves us to sin. To the one who is more than prepared to use that against us and our relationship with God. And where that leads, as we become numb to sin, ultimately is just devastating. Paul looks at that issue of sexual sin because it is one of the greatest stumbling blocks in that pagan culture of the ancient Greek world. But where does that happen for us here in Australia, in our world now? What are, what are the things that we're tempted to go back to? I think we run the risk at any time when we try to incorporate things from our culture into our lives that are simply inconsistent with our faith. That is, we try to fit stuff from the world around us into the way we live as Christians. We're, it, even when it clearly has no place being there. So what is something that we really struggle with, but is part of you know, just quite easily living in the mainstream in Australia right now? I was thinking about this and uh, in the, uh, I was muddling around a little bit and then a sudden, one thing became quite clear. I think the one thing that's become more and more prevalent in our culture is entitlement. In a world dominated by rights, where we are all entitled to something. It might be because of our age or because of our service or because of our standing. We all believe that we are entitled to something. One of the key things for young adults at the moment is that they feel that they are entitled to a house. Like their parents and their parents for generations before them, they believe that they have the right 
to own their own home. They're the little piece of Australia to live in. Otherwise, they are being deprived of a basic human right. And yet in some countries, their homes have disappeared in a moment. Even in our own country, floods and all sorts of different things have just caused houses to just disappear. They're living at the behest of someone else. Do they have a right to a home? Yes, they do have a right to a home. Even the United Nations fundamental rights include having a place to live, a safe place to live. But to own it, that was never promised. It's pretty hard to, to talk about that as well because as we look at our own kids, they're certainly looking to a time when they will own their own home. But the way things are, and one son in the, in the music industry, I don't know that he ever will, to be honest. It's uh, not until we shake off this mortal coil, but um, no, that's tricky. And then there is the right to express yourself. Many people use that really well, but some people use it to decry someone else and what they believe in or the cause they represent. How do our entitlements work then? And then there's the right uh, to do what we want when we retire. Friends of ours dreamt of retiring and traveling, enjoying the years that they had together. Instead, after marrying their uh, three children off in one year and some significant health issues, they're going to have to retire early and they will be fortunate if they can even repay their debts by the time they finish this life. Another couple ended up bailing their daughter out of a really bad business and a bad marriage. So after years of working hard and being quite successful in business, they have, they have the pension, which is great, but nothing else. And that's not through any fault of their own. Praise God that we have the pension in our country and we can be entitled to that here. But the problem is not that we have these things. None of them are wrong in their own right. But by focusing on our entitlements, we fall into the norms of our society. We start to think about what we should have rather than focusing on what should motivate us. What is it that should motivate us? Purely and simply, it's the love of God. If we really want to please God, we should be living lives that are less motivated by what we want what we feel we are entitled to and focus rather on how much God has shown his love for us. And out of that, thinking about how we should show his love for others, both among us here as part of a church, but beyond as well. Because then, then people get to see a snapshot of God because you are displaying him through all you do and who you are out of love. Maybe that is that uh, that may sorry may that be our difference that God makes through us in this world, because when everything else is gone and we can no longer take anything with us, one thing will remain: love. Let's pray. Gracious God, as we come here this morning, it's a uh, we. It's very easy to just focus on who you are and what you've given us uh, in, uh, within these walls. And it's so easy to sing songs of how we give ourselves totally to you. But Lord, we leave here and we step out into the world. We step out into so many other different uh, influences, so many other things telling us what we should do, what we should be, how we should live. Lord, may we be anchored in you. May we hold fast to you. And Lord, above all, may we display our love to all as we go. In Jesus' name. Amen. We come to our final hymn.